you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I am very excited to give this talk. First, because I'm speaking, I'm, I get to tell you the story about how my team and I help build a product that people love, millions of people love, and I get to talk about one of my favorite programming languages. So if you don't know me, my name is Neto, Neto Farah. No affiliation with the supermarket, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an engineering manager at, at Segment. But this is not a story about Segment. This is a story about my previous employer, IFTTT, or IFT, if this, then that, if you're not familiar with the service. If you're not familiar with what it does, IFT is a platform that allows you to connect two different services on the internet and create things that weren't possible before. And in this talk, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of how uh, the IFT's architecture evolved over time. So this is what I call uh, V0, or the inception of a lot of apps, and especially from uh, if this, then that. It started out as a Ruby on Rails application. I call it the monorail. It's simple, it's easy to understand, and it's usually how you would start any app. You have your, your clients here on, on the left, and you have all of the code and all the features in this other place on to the right. But as we grew, it picked up some love. It picked up millions of users. It, because of the nature of that service that we're building, we're also seeing billions of API calls every day. And over the course of uh, the first few years, we built a website, we built an iOS app, and we also built an Android app. But that architecture, it started to become a little challenging as we picked up this love and new people came on board and millions of users started to use our app. So what are some of the challenges that we saw with that V0 monorail architecture that we started out? Now we have multiple stakeholders working on this app. You have mobile developers building their APIs. You have front-end developers building their site. You have back-end developers building all those integrations that were going on. There's multiple SLAs now for that app because you're combining all of those services online and you're also building a front end and APIs in the same place. So we knew we needed to make, we needed to make some changes to that. And basically what we decided to do is to go with the microservices oriented architecture. So this is not necessarily a talk about microservices. I'm not here to talk about the merits of using microservices, but to tell you a little bit of what the things that we experimented with and the lessons we learned from it. So I like to call this V1 as monorail plus friends. So you see that we started to extract out a few of the different concerns that used to exist in that monolithic app and extract them into microservices. So we extracted recommendations, geolocation, fee, uh, feeds for our users, and a lot of other stuff. And one thing that you notice that's particularly interesting about this architecture that we decided to go was that the clients communicate directly with the services. So some, uh, I could have my Android app talking to the monorail and to the geolocation, the same thing with the web client, the same thing with the iOS client. And we thought that architecture would scale and everything would be OK, and we could just keep adding new services and growing that architecture. But what we learned was that there were some challenges with it. So this is what that diagram really looks like. Whenever you decide to extract services and put things in the network that are not the most super reliable medium, you're going to start to run into some challenges. And those are some of the challenges we saw. We saw that there's congestion in the network the moment that you decide to have your services communicate uh, with, with each other. We saw that the network is unreliable. We saw that there's more things to break the more components that you add to your architecture. And because of that, as a consequence of that extra difficulty, we also started to repeat a lot of concerns. We had to implement security everywhere, auditing, and all of those little services and uh, reliability concerns all over the place. So we looked at what other people were doing when they decided to adopt this sort of uh, service-oriented architecture. And one thing that we learned is that there's this thing called an API gateway. So what is an API gateway? Basically, it's that 
you take some of those cross-cutting concerns, those things that you're repeating in each one of your services, and you pull them into this one central entity in your architecture, and you have your clients communicate with that gateway, and you let that gateway deal with a lot of those cross-cutting concerns. So when you see a request coming in, we now have our clients talking to this entity, and then that just spreads the calls that it needs to make. It coordinates things. It joins the data together. And it, you pull all of those extra responsibilities from the, your services in the monolith. But API gateways also have their limitations. And the first one that we came across is that there's different access patterns. So that's actually something very common when you're building APIs and you have a, a diverse set of clients that are consuming those APIs. You notice that um, sometimes your uh, mobile apps are going to need different data than your web app. So you run into this case where you have uh, multiple use cases, and you're challenged with this notion of, like, do I build pure endpoints, and do I follow a complete uh, something that's com completely compliant with REST APIs, and I just build one concern in each one of my endpoints, or do I build some of these Frankenstein sort of uh, endpoints too that would just cater to all my clients at the same time? And another problem we saw was just ambiguity with APIs. And of course, those can be solved with documentation. They could be solved with conventions too. And here's an example of a universal com uh, convention. This sign is the universal sign for OK. And any country I go to give one of these talks or that I talk to people, everyone confirms that, yeah, this should be OK. Except if you go to this country where I grew up in, you notice that this convention can mean something entirely different. So even when you have conventions between your APIs and between your clients, it's also easy to just maybe have this one part that would just interpret that convention completely different. So we looked into more things, and we, we learned about this thing called the backend for front ends, or BFFs, in short for BFF. And what really is a BFF is that because you have diverse use cases, you have your mobile apps and your uh, partner APIs or your web clients just needing different access to the data or different ways to consume your data, you, why not just create some of those API gateways and create one specifically for each one of your user experiences? So you can extract these little coordinators and then just have your own feature teams own them. So that's where the notion of backend for, from, for front ends comes from, is that it allows your front end team, your front end experience, to control the way that they want to consume the data that you can expose. So you can reduce async coordination that, need, that used to exist in the clients. You can deploy your backends individually. You can cater to different use cases. You can deal with different SLAs. And they can be coded individually, and they can be owned by their own feature teams. But there's still a fair amount of repetition here with just pulling all of those things apart. So we realized we're just extracting code and then repeating a lot of things. So we thought maybe there would be a good idea to extract some of those common patterns that we learned, some of the lessons that we learned, and create our own library. And we decided to call it Buffalo. So at the end of the day, Buffalo is nothing more than a BFF, but in a collection of patterns that you can use to build your little BFFs. You would just bring all of these things. But this is JS Congress. Why am I talking about architecture? Why am I talking about REST and microservices? And the reason is we decided to build Buffalo with Node. And there are a few reasons why you would want to build a service coordinator or a BFF in Node. One, because Node and JavaScript are awesome. I shouldn't have to convince anyone here. But in reality, one, the two things that we're most excited about is that a lot of people know JavaScript. If you're used to building features on the web, you're catering to a massive audience of engineers that will know JavaScript. And also, because it's very easy to learn. It's, it's a language that was created in, in 10 days, JavaScript. So there's not that much to pick up. But even more importantly is that Node comes with simple concurrency primitives, and JavaScript too. We as a community are just so used to write asynchronous and concurrent code in, Java, in JavaScript that it just makes sense to use something like that. So this is where I think get, things get really interesting, is that I, I wanted to share some of the lessons that we learned building uh, reliable BFFs with Node and some of the things that we can reuse there. So the first thing, let's look at how one would load async resources using Node.js. The first thing you would have to do is 
You just reach for a URL, you get a result, and you render it on the screen. Super easy. I know this thing is happening asynchronously. If I want to load more than one resource at a time, I can go in and I can fetch a URL from my feed service. I can fetch another URL from my location service. And then I can just wait on those uh, two promises and combine the results and send them down to the clients. So if you know how to do this, you know 80% of everything that you need to know to create a BFF with Node. But of course, things are not simple. Do you remember that chart that I showed before? So this is the very first thing that you run into when you decide to go in a service-oriented architecture. You realize that the communication through the network is not free. And it can actually be really complicated. So if there's one thing I want you to take from this talk of going uh, the services route is that latency and network volatility are a thing. You might not think they're, they're really a reality until you see these things in production. So let's take a look again at our, the feed service. So here is a, a, just a snapshot that I took from this server and then just kind of how it behaved in production. So our feed service, you see that the average response time for it is around 200 milliseconds. But it's not unlikely that sometimes it would spike to even 1,500 milliseconds. So we know it's a, it's a fairly, uh, it works fairly well as a service. It would return responses most of the time around 200 milliseconds. But sometimes, for whatever reason, it could just spike. So assuming that's our feed service, if you have infinite resources, here's the easiest way that you can solve for that problem. You just fetch that URL multiple times, and you get the quickest response back, and then you show it. But I think we can do a little bit better than that. Let's see what sort of solution we can use for this. And one tool that's very useful when you're building services that are uh, distributed like this is to use things like timeouts. So let's take a look at some code. We know that the 99 percentile for that service was around 1,500 milliseconds. So we can optimize for that worst case scenario. And here's where I think uh, some of the newer features that you can get from uh, JavaScript get really interesting. Is that I love this little library called uh, ptimeout. And basically what it does, it allows you to add a timeout to any promise that you're using. So in this case, if you look, we're just requiring ptimeout. And then we're wrapping our get function that returns a promise with ptimeout. And we're giving it a timeout of 1,600 milliseconds. So we're just adding a little buffer to, that, to those 1,500 milliseconds. And then if it works, it works. If it fails, we'll just raise a timeout error. But there's this other scenario, too. It's not just the slow connections. It's the things will start to fail a lot more than before when you have everything in one place. So for this, one thing that we can use is retries. That's like the next uh, logical tools that you can use to deal with flaky network collections. And again, here's another uh, little promise library that I like a lot. And the reason I decided to use and show all of these promise libraries is that I want everyone here to see that because promises have this really uh, strict API that you can just build clients on, on top of. You can use all of these libraries to compose promises and to compose all of these things and get still the same uh, set of APIs. And your clients can be completely oblivious to what your promises and your backend code is doing. So when you look here, I'm using pretry. And the thing that I wanted to try here is that I want to retry two times before I give up. So basically, the same idea. I have a load feed uh, function down there. It just returns a promise. And I'm wrapping it with a retry call. And I'm telling it to try two times if it fails the first time. But what happens now when I'm combining failures and latency in my services? When, when all, both of these problems happen at the same time, what do I do? So maybe one idea here would be to use timeouts and retries. Maybe I can combine all those two tools that I just learned and see what I can do with them. So let's take another look. When we look closely, we still have the same 1,500 milliseconds there. We have the average response time at, 100, at about 200 milliseconds. But if we look, we'll see that there's a median there. And the median is around 150 milliseconds. And what it means, it means in the context of this, you looking at response times here for my server, is that at least 50% of all my responses are going to return under 150 milliseconds. So that's just telling me a lot about how this service behaves in, in production. It's, it's, actually not, it's actually not that common that I would see a 1,500 millisecond uh, response time. So let's take a look again, just recapping. 
most responses are fast. They're around 200 milliseconds for that service. And slow responses are actually pretty rare. So what if we tried something a little different? Instead of optimizing for the worst case scenario, maybe I can bank on statistics here. And because when we do the math, it's like well, three pretty quick requests will only take about 750 milliseconds and versus just one slow request that would take a full second and a half. So I'm talking about promises. You saw that I like promises. So uh, let's just use promises again and see what we can do here. So starting simple, again, Instead of optimizing now for the scenario where I would get a 1,500 millisecond timeout, what if I use something like a 250 milliseconds and just bank on the probability of a request res uh, of response returning faster than 200 milliseconds? So the same idea again. I will use my uh, p timeout library that I like a lot. I will pass in my load feed function and I'll give the I'll give it the timeout of 250 milliseconds, and I'll move on. So Still on top of that, I can bring my retries. So I'll do the same thing now. I'm using, you can see the P timeout is on like the innermost part of that function call, and I'm wrapping it with the P retry, and I'm just going to give it two retries, which means it will try the first time, retry, and then retry again, and everything is wrapped. It has a function that returns the P timeout uh, promise. So again, I'm comp composing and using the same API that's consistent across all of these libraries. And then I could go one extra step, because I know that if I try the third time, it's likely that it will fail anyway. I can even give it a more aggressive timeout. So now we're looking at a feed timeout of 250 milliseconds, a total timeout of 700 milliseconds, two retries, and everything is wrapped in the same function call, but everything still has the same API. I'm still uh, returning the same then and catch calls at the end, so I could have my I could have my clients to be completely oblivious as to what's going on within the promise that I'm trying to resolve. And of course, this thing can get even more complex. I could keep keep going for maybe another 20 minutes on extra things that we can add on top of that. But if you're curious, I would recommend checking out conditional retries, exponential backoffs for when things start to fail across my services, and even circuit breakers that you can build with libraries using uh, promises. So let's take a look at, again, another example of how you can use promises or async await to create uh, well-behaved uh, BFFs. Let's take a look at another service. So you saw we had the feed service. It was a little. Uh, it was pretty consistent, but sometimes it would spike, and you wanted to optimize for that. But now we're going to look at a different example. We're going to look at this service that we used to have that was just for calculating analytics. So one thing that's interesting about most analytics services that um, we build in the tools is that they're very sensitive to spikes in throughput. So this is uh, another snapshot of how uh, an analytics service could look like in production. And if you see down here, you see the throughput is just the number of calls that we're making to that from uh, a given client to a service. And you see that when we make a few more calls, the response time just spikes. So that means that like, this service cannot take that many requests at the same time. So we might need to create a well-behaved client that will only access it uh, slowly. So again, another thing that we can do. So let's assume we have 100 queries, and we run, them, run all of them, but we cannot run more than 10 queries at the same time. We can use this other really nice library that's another abstraction on top of promises called plimit. So with plimit, I can guarantee that given a set of 100 uh, promises, I can only execute 10 at a time. So in here, I'm mapping over all of those queries that I had, and I'm returning this only 10 function that takes in a function that fetches my analytics query. And then at the end, I'm running promise all on all of those promises. And what I think is fascinating is that if you look at that last line, that last line of code, we still have the same exact API. But we know now, because we implemented only 10 there at the top, we know that only 10 uh, functions are going to run at a given time. So as one query finishes, another one gets slotted in. If five queries finish, another five are going to be slotted in. And then you can just distribute all of that load. Another thing that I think is fascinating, especially when you look at uh, async await, is that writing code like this with uh, callbacks would be so complicated to do something like this. 
right? And I could do the same idea when I run an analytics query, I wait for it to finish, I give my service 250 milliseconds just to rest, to give it a break, and then I come back on while loop. That's, uh, that's something that without async await would be incredibly hard to do. There are a lot of other cool ideas to uh, things that you can do with promises and with async await and some of the newer APIs that you would get uh, with JavaScript is that using then's leap, like I just showed, it allows you to have a promise that just uh, takes a uh, an amount of time that it has to sleep and not do any work. You can use pdefer defer to defer promises. You can build priority queues by just using something like uh, pq. You can go nuts and create a circuit breaking uh, platform just using uh, opossum, this uh, NPM library that you can check out. And what I learned and what we learned as a team as we were building, evolving that architecture and evolving uh, the clients that we were building for our BFF is that you can use promises and async await as very simple concurrency primitives. And they have a very low barrier, barrier of entry. So teaching our iOS engineers, our Android engineers, to use these very simple constructs by building one on top of the other made things a lot uh, less challenging for us to introduce a new uh, piece of technology in our stack. But of course, promises also have limitations. So I would look into cancellations. It's still something that's a little in flux. Error handling can be a little bit tricky for people that are just uh, beginning with promises in JavaScript. And stack traces are still aren't uh, really perfect. And there's even more stuff. The, just building a BFF is not just making building clients that can connect, connect to different services. There's also things like param validation that we build libraries for. And I would recommend checking out this library I wrote. There was also testing different endpoints, still uh, banking on uh, new technology on, uh, with JavaScript. And if you want to build more sophisticated async programming, if promises are not enough for you, you can always go a step forward and try things like RS, RxJS. And I'm excited because there's a talk about RxJS right after mine with Yuri. So I recommend watching that talk too. But the main lesson that we learned is that you can always start with the simplest solution that you can think of and then just grow it from there. We started from a monolith. We extracted services out of it. We realized that ser uh, coordinating services from your clients was pretty challenging, so we moved to an API gateway sort of platform. We noticed that it was really hard to cater to different clients and to different use cases, so we went the BFF route by extracting things out. We noticed we're repeating a lot of code, and we decided to create more patterns and libraries to help us solve those problems. And then we started with simple clients, added retries, added timeouts, added more and more reliability sort of features and kept building on from there. You can feel free to grab me in the hallway, ask me questions, tweet at me, email me. I'm very excited about VFFs and Node and Promises. Thank you.